Welcome to the Spring 2021 MJC Speech Night. I'm Professor Tori Shim, and I coach the MJC Speech and Debate Team along with my colleague, Professor Ryan Guy. Students on the team invest countless hours preparing and practicing their events, competing against students from other colleges and universities around the state and nation. In tonight's event, students from the team will offer a showcase of their competitive events, including limited preparation, platform speeches, oral interpretation, and debate. The speakers you will see tonight are award-winning. Many of them have taken gold, silver, and bronze at our regional and state championships. Before we begin, I want to thank everyone in the Communication Studies Department and the Arts, Humanities, and Communication Division. I also want to thank all of the students on the team who invest incredible time and effort in this activity, and all of you watching from home. Enjoy the show. Good evening and thanks for joining us. My name is Ryan Guy and I'm a professor of communication studies here at Modesto Junior College and it's been my absolute privilege for the last several years to help direct the Modesto Junior College speech and debate team. Tonight, I get the distinct honor of introducing that team to you all. And so, in alphabetical order, Nikki Daniels, Michael Dull, Kylie Duncan, Rachel Flick, Amanda Hebb, Sierra Pangelina, Clarice Perez, Christina Peterson, Alexis Rangel, Desiree Roth, Jose Saldana, D'Angelo Sanchez Johnson, and Sandra Sullivan. The first event is impromptu speaking. This is a limited preparation event. In this speech, the speaker is given a set of random prompts and has only two minutes to prepare a five minute speech. Despite the time crunch, the speaker is still expected to be organized, produce substantive content, and deliver the presentation with style. Tonight's impromptu speaker will be Alexis Rangel. Alexis has been on the team for two semesters and recently took second place in this event at one of our regional tournaments. I have a blank note card and a pen and I will be pulling up the prompts on my computer followed by the prep time leading directly into the speech itself. So I will begin my prep time now. Thirty seconds used. One minute used. It is April 5th, 1994. You are a 17 year old boy. You find out you have just been convicted to prison for a crime you did not commit. This is the story of Lamonte McIntyre, who was released 23 years later and is now finally ready to share his story about his wrongful conviction. The world, or what seemed like the world to him, told him to avoid speaking out about the injustices that were ensued upon him. But instead, he chose to take action. He chose to speak and is now an activist against these errors committed by our legislation and judicial systems. What Lamonte McIntyre decided to do and his actions relate to the quotation directly today, which reads, I will not adjust myself to the world. I am adjusted to myself by Anais Nin. And I interpreted this to mean live in accordance with your perspective. I agree with this quotation. 
So we will examine the ways that I do through first, a communication theory that involves perspective. Second, individuals who chose to create a technology that benefits the world. And lastly, an organization who is fighting for a cause that a lot of individuals in the world do not agree with. So first, the communication theory. The communication accommodation theory was developed by Howard Giles in 1971. Within this communication theory, it essentially sees the way that we make adjustments to, towards our social differences. So it essentially sees if we choose to enlarge or minimize these social differences. Do we choose convergence to assimilate or divergence to be different? For example, if I was to tell an individual to give me a buzz later, odds are I'd be to an older individual and I'd essentially be telling them to give me a phone call or a text message. And in contrast, if I was to tell somebody to tap in later or to hit my line later, I'd be instructing them essentially to do the same thing, to contact me later, but it would oddly or usually be to a younger individual. So I chose to assimilate myself. I chose divert or convergence through both of these social interactions because I tailored towards the slang of each of the individuals, one being older individuals and then another being the youth. Individuals choose the ways they want to communicate to best share their perspective. In Lamonte McIntyre's story, he chose divergence. Wrongful conviction is not something that's popular or main mainstream, but it is still something that is very apparent. He chose the divergence of his perspectives to share and thus it's fueling his activism today. In the same way that he sought to incite action, this next individual did the exact same thing, or rather collective. These are four North Carolina State students who developed a revolutionary nail polish. So what instructed them to develop this nail polish was a friend of theirs, a girl, and she told them that she had been sexually assaulted while in a nightclub. So what this nail polish does is once it is mixed in with your drink, the nail polish changes color if activated by specific substances. It can test for things like Xanax. According to Rain.org, women aged 16 to 19 are four times more likely than the general population to be raped or sexually assaulted. The world tends to avoid talking about these types of topics, or the world tends to deflect things, saying it's at the fault of the woman. The woman shouldn't be wearing that clothing. The woman shouldn't be going out. The woman this and the woman that. These four boys took what their friend experienced and they, changed, they turned it into action. Whereas the world often turns a blind eye to these issues, they tackled it face on. And this is something that's becoming more and more common and a technology that is being widely used as the years progress. In the same way that they sought to activate change and not only that, but also educate, this next group did the exact same thing. Four Ocean is an environmentalist group, an organization out of Boca Raton, Florida, and they aim to help clean up the ocean. They talk a lot about water pollution and air pollution and everything involving the natural world. We have individuals like Boy and Slat who are helping a benefit environmentalist groups all around the world. So what this organization does that is really unique is they have a one pound per product deal. So essentially for every one product you purchase from their website, they clean up one pound of debris from the ocean. They're helping incite change and it is fueled by other activists, not only Boy and Slat, but also Greta Thunberg and a lot of other uh, youth environmentalists and activists. So while the world often chooses to tailor towards the majority, we really are often neglectful of things that do not directly benefit us. We see ourselves in such high priority, we often don't pay attention to things like the environment. So this group strives to create and enact change and be different through their perspectives. They are seeking to educate individuals about environmentalism and how to benefit the world that we live in today. So within these different examples, first Lamonte McIntyre, second the communication theory, and last an the group of individuals and a collective within an organization, we saw why I agreed with the interpretation of the quotation today, which read, I will not adjust myself to the world, I am adjusted to myself by Anais Nen. These individuals chose to assimilate convergence or to differentiate divergence within each of their methods in order to help enact change. Whereas the world turns a blind eye to these issues, they tackle these issues head on face forward. The second event you will see is an informative speech. This type of speech introduces cutting edge topics and seeks to help the audience understand the subject by using well-developed explanations 
that are supported with factual information. The goal is not to sway an audience's opinion, but rather to share with them a wealth of knowledge regarding innovations and discoveries. The informative speaker you will hear from tonight is Sierra Pangelinen. It is Sierra's first semester on the team, and she recently took first place with this speech at the Northern California Regional Championship Tournament. Hyperaccumulator. The word itself brings to mind the type of techno babble you'd expect to hear Han Solo yelling about as the Millennium Falcon fails to jump into hyperspace. While this isn't an interdimensional form of space travel, it is something that can help humanity make huge jumps in the way we process raw materials. You see, hyperaccumulators are actually a special type of plant with the unique ability to absorb metals from the soil in which they grow. Today, I will be explaining how phytomining with hyperaccumulators could revolutionize the way we mine raw materials. First, we will dig up some background on phytomining, then seed the soil with the plethora of benefits before finally harvesting some potential implications. Now, what exactly is phytomining? Phytomining is the harvesting of metal from plants known as hyperaccumulators. According to the New York Times in 2020, the word phytomining was created by Rufus Cheney with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Of course, this practice didn't start with him. In the 16th century, a man by the name of Georgius Agricola was already performing the practice of mineral smelting. Agricola stated that if you knew what to look for in a leaf, then you could deduce what lay in the ground below. Dr. Baker, a botany professor with the University of Melbourne, explains the process of phytomining, which he observed on a small farm on the island of Borneo. Every six to 12 months, a farmer shaves off one foot of growth from these nickel hyperaccumulating plants and proceeds to burn or squeeze the biomass in order to extract the metal. After a short purification process, Farmers could hold in their hands roughly 500 pounds of nickel citrate, potentially worth thousands of dollars on the international market. According to the BBC in 2020, hyperaccumulators store the metal in their roots, leaves, shoots, or sap. Aside from the fact that is plant versus earth, how is phytomining so different from our current method? Phytomining differs from our current method based on source, and process of obtaining metal. Our current method of obtaining nickel and other metals is through the method of ore mining. According to Britannica, accessed on February 13, 2021, the mining of laterites is an earth-moving process, with large shovels, drag lines, or front-end loaders extracting the nickel-rich strata and discarding large boulders and other waste material. The Air National Council on Mining and Metals states that mining is a very restrictive process. The deposits must be on the surface or underground. Metal deposits are becoming more scarce, creating more sensitive and hazardous work environments as we are forced to dig deeper into the earth. Once all the potential minerals have been scavenged for and smelted at a particular site, the earth that is left behind is toxic and deemed uninhabitable for other plant life. This is why the harvesting of hyperaccumulators could be a revolutionary savior to the mining industry. Now that we understand what phytomining is, how can these special hyperaccumulator plants help us? There are three key uses. First, phytomining could help meet the demand for metals like nickel and zinc. Second, hyperaccumulators can be used to remove toxins from the soil. And finally, these plants may be the answer to some concerns about metal-rich soils, like that on Mars, as we expand our exploration of space. In an article by Our Daily Planet in 2020, they state that the potential for phytomining is greatest for nickel due to its occurrence in specific soils, which are enriched and occur naturally around the world. At present, Malaysia and the Philippines are the world's largest supplier of nickel also claiming host to a native class of hyperaccumulator plants, the Philanthus class. The concentration of metals found in the sap of the Philanthus plants has the potential to offset the damage done by mining due to our great need for it in everyday items. In an article by New Scientist, 
published earlier this year, the growing push for environmentally friendly and sustainable energy sources, such as wind turbines and rechargeable batteries, allows us to use phytomining as part of the solution. Certain classes of hyperaccumulator plants can be used to detoxify the land and help clean up the environment. Farmers would be able to use these crops in meadow-rich soils, and mining companies could use these plants for waste removal at former mining sites. The Brassica juncea is a hyperaccumulator which absorbs copper and zinc. This particular plant is used in the phytoremediation process, which refers to the removal of toxins from the soil. Once all the toxins have been absorbed, the plant tissues can be harvested to collect the accumulated metals. Thus far, the metal from the Brassica juncea has been used to create carbon nanotubes and zinc oxide nanoparticles, both of which are common in products like cosmetics and rubber. The Brassica juncea may not be common in our area, but the sunflower certainly is. According to calflora.org, accessed on February 17, 2021, the Helianthus anus is a sunflower native to California and a great hyperaccumulator. The National Library of Medicine states that the sunflower is a prime hyperaccumulator, collecting large concentrations of zinc in its leaves and stems. We have hyperaccumulators growing all around us. It is up to us to use them to their fullest potential. Another beneficial application for hyperaccumulators is Martian life. As of February 18, 2021, NASA landed their fifth rover and an autonomous helicopter on Mars with the intent of studying the soil and atmosphere. As of 2017, NASA stated that Mars has all the essential macro and micronutrients needed to sustain plant life. A major concern among scientists is the presence of metal-rich soils on Mars. Hyperaccumulators could be the perfect subjects for the Martian metal-rich soil, full of magnesium, sodium, potassium, and chloride, based on an article by Space.com in 2017. In other words, these hyperaccumulators have implications that are out of this world. Despite all the positive benefits, there's reason to proceed with caution. Let's identify the potential drawbacks. Phytomining, although useful, poses potential problems in other areas. To grow a significant amount of crop, the first thing you need is land. A 2020 New York Times article by Ian Morse explains that critics are concerned that the hunt for desirable land could lead to deforestation and the removal of animal habitats. These are concerns to take seriously. However, the same article goes on to explain that hyperaccumulators thrive in areas that have already been deforested and survive where other plants cannot. Along with the need for land comes the need for time. Hyperaccumulators require a growth period of 6 to 12 months before harvesting can take place. The same article cites Dr. Baker with the University of Melbourne, who explains that hyperaccumulator harvesting isn't sufficient enough to replace traditional ore mining techniques. Finally, remember when I mentioned that these plants could be used to detoxify the land through fire mediation? Well, unfortunately, the plants used in the phytoremediation process become toxic themselves after absorbing so much of the toxic remnants. Once all of the toxins have been absorbed and the, plant, the land is seen fit to grow and nurture other plant life forms, these earth-saving hyperaccumulators must be removed and disposed of properly to reduce the risk of contaminating the other plants. This is why that although hyperaccumulators seem like superhero plants, they are not a panacea to all of our concerns about traditional mining and environmental rehabilitation. To reiterate, hyperaccumulators are metal harvesting plants used in phytomining. Today, we dug up some background on phytomining, seeded the soil with a plethora of benefits, before finally reaping some potential implications. Phytomining is an innovation that has the power to revolutionize the way we extract materials from the earth and clean up the environment. But as always, we must be careful to avoid paths that may lead us to the dark side. 
At the end of the day, the choices we make today will determine if we live on the lush planet of Endor or the desert wasteland of Tatooine. The third speech you will hear is a persuasive speech. This is a presentation that seeks to identify and describe an ongoing problem. The speaker uses emotion, logic, and credibility in an attempt to urge the audience to act on a controversial issue. Tonight, Christina Peterson will present her persuasive speech. It is Christina's second semester on the team, and she recently took bronze at the state championship tournament with this presentation. Anna and David had only been dating for a few weeks when she realized he was surveilling her. He'd made a comment about something I'd only shared privately in Facebook Messenger with a relative, she told MIT Technology Review in July 2019. He knew where I was at all times, who I was talking to on email, text message, social media, all of it. He could see everything. Anna was targeted by a software known as Stalkerware, and the use of these tracking apps is on the rise. In fact, Cision PR Newswire reported in July of 2020 that there has been a 51% increase in the use of spying and stalking apps since the start of the COVID-19 lockdown. A key part of the problem is that many of these apps legally masquerade as parental control apps in Google Play or the App Store. Once they're on a device, many of these apps go undetected. This is part of what the executive director of UN Women describes as a growing shadow pandemic of violence against women. Thus, we must hold developers to more rigorous ethical standards. Google and Apple must stop allowing covert surveillance apps on their platforms, and antivirus companies need to flag stalkerware as malicious software. Today, we will scan the problems with stalkerware, flag the underlying causes, and reset with necessary solution steps. First, let's begin with the problems. Stalkerware is a category of spyware that, just as it sounds, is designed to spy on individuals. What makes stalkerware different, as explained by a June 2020 ZDNet article, is that stalkerware is often advertised as legitimate software and is easily accessible to average users. You see, stalkerware apps are legal as long as you don't use them for illegal purposes. Legal uses include monitoring your minor children or monitoring employees using company-issued devices. However, as explained by cybersecurity specialist Seth Rosenblatt in a February 2020 article for Tom's Guide, in practice, these apps are often used for illegal monitoring. This is because they are designed to be installed on a user's device without their knowledge or consent. In Anna's case, the software was disguised as a picture message David had texted her. Despite this troubling trend, many antivirus companies do not detect these apps, and Rosenblatt goes on to explain that app stores continue to allow them under the logic that it is the end user and not the developer committing illegal actions. Thus, this software remains readily available and presents us with some very real consequences. Take the story of Amy. In an interview with BBC News in October 2019, she describes how her life fell into ruins after her abusive husband installed stalkerware on her devices. He would drop snippets in a conversation, such as knowing about Sarah's baby, really private things he shouldn't have known about. Amy also began to wonder how her husband knew where she was all the time. One day at the pumpkin patch, her husband passed her his phone to show her a picture they'd taken together that day. And in a split second, she saw an alert pop up on his screen reading, daily report on Amy's Mac is ready to view. Through stalkerware, Amy's husband was able to gain full information control over her. Her every move and interaction was logged and formatted in an easy to read report. Amy's husband was stalking her on a daily basis, but sadly, her story is not unique. In fact, an August 2020 article from Karada reports that these incidents have risen by a staggering 91% between 2018 and 2019. Despite the clear dangers posed by stalkerware apps, popular platforms and government entities struggle to control their use. Thus, we must turn our attention to the causes that allow these programs to persist. There are three key factors that contribute to the continued abuse of stalkerware. 
marketing loopholes, lack of detection ability, and lack of legal enforcement. Let's begin with the marketing loopholes. Existing laws regulating locator apps are extremely narrow. According to a June 2020 CNET article, it is illegal to sell spyware primarily intended to secretly tap phones, record private conversations, or steal emails. This seems simple enough. However, the article goes on writing the problem is the word primarily. So as long as an app is not primarily marketed as spyware, it remains legal. This means that even when platforms crack down on stalkerware, the consequences are largely symbolic. Take the case of the app known as Family Locator Safe Zone. This app is available on Google Play and is advertised as an app that can track your children's location. However, according to the previously cited CNET article, archived versions of this app show that it used to be called Girlfriend Cell Tracker. Even though Google took action against this version of the app, the only real outcome was a name change. Thus, this software remains readily available, affordable, it can be hard to make a legal case against because of these loopholes. Furthermore, it can be hard to detect when the software has been installed on a device. While some antivirus companies have moved to recognize stalkerware as malicious, this is not a fully standardized practice. According to a June 2020 article by US News and World Report, antivirus companies are supposed to create solutions to help detect threats and viruses and keep them from harming you, but because so many stalker apps masquerade as legal locator apps, many antivirus companies do not flag them. Finally, even when the software is detected and it's clear an app is being used illegally, there's a lack of legal enforcement. A November 2019 article from Malwarebytes explains that those who install stalkerware with the intent to monitor, control, harass, or otherwise abuse their victims typically get away with it avoiding legal penalty even if there is plenty of evidence to suggest their guilt. The article goes on to cite Erica Olson, director of the Safety Net program at the National Network to End Domestic Violence. She says there is generally a lack of motivation on this issue and a consistent minimization of this type of abuse. Now, granted, this is a complicated issue. However, there is cause for optimism. Because we understand the characteristics of the problem and have exposed the underlying causes, we can begin to tackle this issue with clear and direct action steps. Let's look to our solutions. Cracking down on stalkerware is going to require a multi-pronged approach. As explained in the previously cited article by cybersecurity specialist Seth Rosenblatt, the creators of these programs have continuously found legal loopholes to keep these products accessible. Only by simultaneously pressuring lawmakers, antivirus companies, and device manufacturers can we hope to see change? So first, the legal approach. Current laws at both the state and federal level need to ban apps that covertly spy on users. The nonprofit legal aid group Coalition Against Stalkerware explained on their website, last accessed February of 2021, that such laws would allow them to target developers directly and shut down the bulk of these apps. You can visit their website to help with efforts to pass both state and federal legislation. Next, the antivirus companies. It's painfully clear that we must take swift action even before our legislation and courts of law are fixed. To that end, I'm calling on you to help increase pressure on the companies that make antivirus software. As previously mentioned, most antivirus programs recognize stalkerware as legitimate software and do not alert their users of its presence. EFF Cyber Chief Eva Galprin who hosted a 2019 TED Talk, proposes a very simple solution. Antivirus companies need to accept the common definition of stalkerware proposed by the EFF and update their libraries to detect all instances of these apps. You can help make this a reality by visiting the EFF's website at EFF.org and donating time and or money to increase pressure on these companies. Last. We can also put pressure on the app stores that make these products available. According to their terms of service, both of which were updated in February of 2021, both Google and Apple ban surveillance apps on their platforms. However, they leave the loophole open for apps marketed to track children or employees notified by their employer. This honor system of tracking stalkerware clearly isn't working. We need to send them a message that the continued existence of these apps on their platforms 
is unacceptable and must be remedied. Please consider taking a few minutes after this round to visit your app store and leave a message with their customer service departments. It's clear that more must be done to address the role of technology in domestic violence cases. Today, we've analyzed the problems, causes, and solutions. This issue calls us to take swift action against stalkerware. Anna suffered years of surveillance because of this very software. With coordinated efforts between our legal institutions, software platforms, and antivirus companies, we can ensure that stories like Anna's are a thing of the past. Thank you. Our fourth event is prose. In this presentation, the speaker performs a piece of published literature. Performers seek to move audiences and make their point by embodying the characters and inviting viewers to become immersed in the act of storytelling. The performer you will see tonight is Alexis Rangel. She recently took gold at the state championship tournament with this performance. I know what happens after you die. I take your family into a quiet room with Kleenex, and then I say the word death. Not expired because you are a person, not milk, and not passed on because families always want to believe that just means I transferred you to another hospital. Dead. I have to say it. And that's really all they taught us about breaking bad news in medical school. One hour lecture. So we learn by watching our teaching physicians. We are their constant companions in this sort of theater of the bereaved, lurking in doorways and bedsides and in the hospital's ER, just waiting to see how soft they made their voices. When did they go to touch someone on the shoulder? How much medical jargon did they use before getting to the word dead? When you train to become a doctor, they don't really teach you about death. They teach you how to prevent it how to fight it, how to say it. But not how to face it. According to the US National Library of Medicine, a 2016 survey of healthcare providers discovered that 91% of respondents perceived delivering bad news as a very important skill but only 40% felt that they had the training to effectively deliver such news. And this was before a global pandemic that has resulted in 29.3 million cases of COVID-19 in the United States alone, 530,000 of which have been fatal. The pandemic has continued to intensify challenges, including disruptions in equipment supply chain, provider burnout, and the crushing reality of breaking bad news to families. This is especially challenging because the medical field rightfully rewards technical proficiency, but does not always recognize the importance of communication skills. This leaves medical professionals defenseless against the emotional complexities and communicative intensities that come with the pandemic. Hearing bad news is never easy. A 2020 article from Northwestern points out that patients remember these conversations for the rest of their lives. Doctors remember them too. We will explore this complex reality through the story of one physician who must figure out how to say it by Bess Stillman. So on one of my first days as a teaching physician in the emergency room, as we worked on the body of a 16 year old boy with eight bullet holes in his chest and abdomen, we were almost angry at his body. Is he breathing? Is he bleeding? Is his heart beating? I go to the head of the bed and I plunge a breathing tube down his airway and I hook him up to the monitor that breathes for him. I grab a large bar IV, place one in each arm and an even larger one in his groin. And through that, we start pressure bagging typo negative blood, just trying to replace what he's lost. We put tubes. 
everywhere. I, uh, I call for another unit of blood, but no matter how fast we work, we can't work fast enough. The monitor starts to sound this shrill insect whine that's meant to alert us the patient is crashing, which we already know. So it feels less like a warning and more like a rebuke. And then we lose his blood pressure and his pulse. But he's 16. So I perform a trauma Hail Mary. I grab a 15 blade scalpel and I make an incision from the nipple all the way down to the edge of the bed. I take scissors and I cut through the intercostal membranes, takes bird spreaders, put them between his ribs and we crank his chest open. There's this huge gush of blood and and then a moment of stillness, like a second after a lightning strike. Even his blood smells metallic, like ozone. And I place my hands into his chest, put them on his still heart, and I begin squeezing it for him, feeling for damage, and I take, I take my right hand, sweep it down the length of his aorta, but it is so riddled with holes that the frayed pieces just... disintegrate in my hands. The first time I had to be the one to deliver bad news to a patient. I was in my last year of residency training. I remember I had to do it in the patient's room because his adult daughter refused to leave his bedside. So I said, I'm sorry, he's dead. We did everything we could. And then I was supposed to step out of the room, give her a few moments of privacy, but I was paralyzed to this Bought by the sense of failure and loss. When I looked into the bed, I, I couldn't help but imagine seeing my own father in it. And my supervisor must have seen what was going on because she grabbed me by the arm, dragged me outside and said, don't you ever do that again. Don't you ever pretend that that loss belongs to you when it doesn't. One day, the person you love is going to be in that stretcher. But if today is not the day, you say you're sorry, you mean it, but then you have to walk away. I look up from the boy and I see that my own audience has formed. They wait to see what I do next and I realize in front of me is a gaping hole and the boy's family will probably be here very soon. So I turn to the surgery resident and I say, listen, as fast as you can, you need to get this kid closed up. Not 10 minutes go by when we hear the sound of a woman demanding to be let in. We are not ready. Security tries to keep her out. We are shoving gauze and tubing and surgical equipment into these giant trash bags, but she, she is a tsunami force. We barely have this boy closed up and half covered in a sheet when I see her standing in the doorway. Clearly his mother. She goes absolutely quiet. I'm sorry. He's dead. We did everything we could. She takes a running leap towards the body. A nurse at the head of the bed notices a large needle still attached to the suture holding him together, and she plucks it off the table right before the mother lands on top of his body, trying to protect it with her own. She starts keening. It's a terrible sound. I'm sorry. He's dead. We did everything we could. 
she slides off the boy's body. And I see her put his fingers to her mouth just briefly before placing them against her cheek. I start to walk out as soon as the social worker enters, motioning for the rest of the crowd to follow me out. I, I think that's what they can learn from me, is how to walk away. And without a moment to break, I have to go see the next patient because there are 40 people in the waiting room and they can't know that I still feel the dead boy's heart in my hands, life and anger. But I know that if I don't put it down now, I may never remember that this loss doesn't belong to me. One day, grief will be mine. But not tonight. We have come to our final event, debate. In this style of debate, speakers are randomly assigned to argue opposing sides of a controversial issue. Debate is a true test of critical thinking and strategy, because speakers must often argue for a side they may not personally agree with. Despite this, the speakers must identify and present a valid and compelling case in order to win. The team who prepares the best arguments for their side is declared the winner. In this debate, you will hear from an affirmative speaker and a negative speaker. Tonight, our debaters are Clarice Perez on the affirmative and Michael Dahl on the negative. Michael took silver at a recent tournament and Clarice earned gold at our state championships this past weekend. All right, good evening and welcome everybody. We are excited to get to the debate and without further ado, we're gonna do just that. And so to start things off, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Clarice to give the first affirmative construct speech, which should not be any longer than five minutes. Clarice, we're ready when you are. Okay, I'll begin my speech on my first words. Okay, so the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated, Gandhi. Welcome and thank you for joining us at the spring 2021 speech night debate. Today we are debating the resolution factory farm does more harm than good. Let's start off with a little bit of resolutional analysis. First, let's find fact define factory farming. Meagher and Webster defines this as a large industrialized farm, especially a farm in which large animals of lives, large numbers of livestock are raised indoors in conditions intended to maximize production at minimal costs. Second, we should weigh these arguments through the value of protecting life. At the end of the round, if you believe that factory farming harms life, you should vote for the affirmative. If you believe that factory farming benefits life, you should vote for the negative. Today, I have two key contentions why factory farming does more harm than good. Contention one, the next pandemic and antibiotic resistance. So first, let's start with the claim. Factory farms provide the conditions for viruses and bacterial infections to develop. Second, the data. A December 2020 uh, article from Vice News says that factory farming is a near perfect breeding ground for novel viruses, of which at least 60% are zoonotic. Zoonotic viruses are the ones that can jump from animal to human. We already have historical examples of this. The article cites H1N1 in 2009 when the swine flu spread from a factory farm in North Carolina. Additionally, this type of event has, been, has become more likely for three reasons. First, Vice News explains that factory farms are more crowded than they were a decade ago. The number of hog farms in the United States has dropped by 90%. However, the number of hogs has increased by 50%. Second, policies in 2019 shifted inspection responsibilities from qualified USDA inspectors to plant workers whose training is not regulated. This policy change also increased the maximum speeds on the inspection line. This means employees with less training are inspecting meat at higher speeds. Third, beyond viruses, factory farms are unraveling our ability to cure bacterial infections, according to a 2016 Scientific American report. This is because the diets fed to factory farm animals contain high levels of antibiotics. However, this leads to antibiotic resistance that passes from animal to human. According to WHO, the World Health Organization, this kills up to 700,000 people a year. Finally, the impacts. Pandemics affect every aspect of life, including significant stress on the healthcare system and health workers, impacting education systems and the progress of students, increasing unemployment, poverty, and homelessness, increasing long-term health consequences, and death. 
Thus, when we tie this argument back to our value of protecting the life, we can see that factory farming does much more harm than good due to the high probability of future viral pandemics and already widespread antibiotic resistance leading to death. Second contention, cruelty to animals. First, the claim, factory farming practices are inhumane. According to Peter Singer, a bioethics professor of Princeton University, explains that we ought to put animals on equal moral footing to humans. According to January 2020 Issues and Controversies report, he clarifies that this does not mean we should grant animals all the same rights as humans, but that if an animal feels pain, then the pain matters just as much as when a human feels pain. And according to LA Times, the methods that they use to kill animals in factory farms include packing them into cages, drowning them, clubbing them on the head, and in some cases, hanging them. So, the impacts of this. Animals suffer and die in factory farms. An August 2020 article from The Guardian states the following, the billions of animals slaughtered every year live short, painful, and disease-ridden lives. Animals are frequently frozen, boiled, drowned, or suffocated. And this is due to the mass production that factory farms need. They need to be able to mass produce at fast speeds and quickly to in order to maintain the costs as low as they are. Additionally, animal rights and human rights are connected. A 2019 Vox article reports on research from Harvard and Dartmouth that demonstrates a strong leap between animal rights and human rights. These findings show that individuals who support animal rights are more likely to support human rights. And states with strong animal rights protections also have strong human rights protections. The article states that a political system that sees human suffering and takes action is more likely to be the one that sees animal suffering and takes action and vice versa. When we tie this argument back to the value of protecting life, we see that factory farms lead to suffering and death. Additionally, the logic that allows animal suffering is the same logic that allows human suffering. We can reverse this. So let's see why factory farming uniquely causes this. As I stated, the methods are unique to the uh, factory farming way of killing. However, according to Modern Farmer, small local farms that do their own slaughtering are able to take the time because they aren't mass producing meat at a low cost. That allows them to stun animals so they don't feel pain when they die. Just like we've seen with euthanasia and humane killings of humans when they decide it's their time to go. So overall, this is something we are uniquely seeing in factory farms. And due to the deaths caused by antibiotic re uh, resistance, the deaths caused by pandemics, and the harms that it does to healthcare workers, and overall the inhumane treating of animals specifically in factory farms, it's clear to see that they do harm, more harm than good. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Clarice. With that, we'll open things up to cross-examination. Michael, you control this cross-ex. You've got two minutes to ask questions. I'm ready when you are. Okay, thank you, Professor. Um, I'll just start my cross-examination time right now. Um, first off, Clarice, thank you for doing this debate with me. My first question for you is, uh, you mentioned that factory farming is a perfect breeding ground for viruses and uh, potentially the next pandemic. Do you have any data on how deadly these viruses could potentially be? Right. I mean, obviously, we've seen with um, the H1N1, that was a particularly deadly virus. And as we've seen, virus and pandemics are getting deadlier and deadlier. With articles stating, and according to CDC and WHO, that uh, even with COVID-19, that is not the deadliest pandemic that we're going to see. Pandemics are getting deadlier due to um, the, the way that we live on Earth. So yes, I would say that pandemics in the future will be more deadly and are already deadly. Okay, thank you. Uh, my next question deals with antibiotic resistance. Right. Um, you said that this is a, a big problem with 700,000 people dying every year uh, as okay. a result of antibiotic resistance. Um, my question, though, is uh, how do you know that this antibiotic resistance is solely the fault of factory farms? Right. So we can see here by a research study done in Denver, Colorado, that animals in the United States factory farms consume over 80 percent of our nation's antibiotics. So overall, the fact that we're seeing 80% of antibiotics goes to animals sees that the large amount of antibiotics we're entering human bodies is coming from animals. Uh, is the potency of these antibiotics the same uh, as it, if a human were to just be prescribed the antibiotic in a pill form? Absolutely, they're the same an antibiotics being prescribed to humans as well as animals. Okay, thank you for that. And then my final question uh, deals with uh, the morality argument. Right. Um, do you know what the emotional capacity of animals like a cow, for example, how that compares to that of a human being? Right. Emotional capacity and feeling pain are two separate things, but I would say that animals still feel emotion, but specifically when it comes to pain, the way that animals feel pain is much the same as, as humans, and the fact that they still feel pain, and the way that factory farms are killing them with absolutely no stunning is inhumane. Okay. Thank you. And that ends, uh, ends cross-ex. Thanks for that. 
All right, I'm going to turn the floor officially over to the negative now. Michael, this is the first negative constructive speech. You get up to six minutes for this uh, this speech, but please start us off with a brief off time roadmap before you begin. Whatever you are. Okay, thank you, for Professor. Um, for my roadmap, I'll just uh, go over top of case first, uh, specifically the definitions. Uh, then I'll move into my two counter contentions, and I'll conclude by going over uh, Curtis's two contentions. So it'll be essentially top of case my current contentions, the rest of the top of case. Uh, I'll start my time right now. So um, first off, I just wanna say that I agree with all of the definitions that Clarice um, offered, and I agree with the weighing mechanism of protecting life. Although I would add the caveat that ultimately we should be a bit more concerned with human life. Uh, I mean, obviously we do need to care about the lives of animals, but uh, given that we are humans, it's safe to prioritize humans a bit more than that of animals. Uh, moving on uh, to my two uh, counter contentions. Um, first, I wanna point out that according to plantbasednews.org, 99% of farmed animals in the US live on factory farms. This means when we are talking about factory farms, we are talking about the industry that is the source of 99% of our meat and dairy products in the US. That brings me to my first counter contention, which is that uh, out of affordable foods. The claim here is that food prices in the U.S. have remained stable because of factory farming. That uh, I have the backup, this claim comes from the USDA, which in 2015 did an in-depth analysis of agricultural output between 1948 and 2013 and found that the shift from traditional farming to factory farming resulted in a 300% increase in output while keeping inputs at the same or even lower levels. What this all accumulates to is the reality that we rely on factory farming to feed this country. This industry is not only incredibly efficient, but like I mentioned before, it is responsible for 99% of the meat and dairy that we consume. Additionally, a 2019 report from the USDA found that 34.9% of households with incomes below the federal poverty line were food insecure. Uh, what this all means is that if food prices were to go up, which is inevitable with the abolishment of factory farming, more Americans will go hungry. Affordable food is essential to the protection of human life. Therefore, factory farming is essential to the protection of human life. Moving on, my next kind of contention deals with that of rural jobs. Factory farms employ and support large numbers of people and contribute greatly to local economies. According to a regularly updated report published by the USDA's National Agricultural Service, over 22 million Americans are employed by the large-scale industrial agriculture industry. This means that one in every 12 Americans work in a job connected to factory farming. Uh, the vast majority of these jobs are found in rural communities, and the report goes on to point out that the industrialization of farming results in more high-tech jobs, including engineers, programmers, statistical analysis, and many more. These operations bring investment, financial stability and healthcare to rural areas like ours in the Central Valley. Put it simply, the benefit in rural jobs makes factory farming essential to the protection of life. Moving on to the two uh, contentions brought up by Clarice. First, we'll deal with that of the fact that of breeding ground, a breed, that factory farms are a breeding ground for viruses. And so here, I just wanna say that the impact of this contention it's not all that Clarice would like it to make it seem. We, we can even see with examples like the one she offered with H1N1, uh, this wasn't a 30, 40, 50% uh, mortality rate virus. It was very, very low, less than 1% uh, of all people that got H1N1 died from it. And so when we're dealing with uh, pandemics, we need to realize that there's a very big difference between a deadly pandemic like that of the Black Plague uh, or, or Black Death uh, and that of H1N1. And then moving on uh, to the point that many people develop uh, bacterial resistance uh, and or, or the bacteria itself uh, develops resistance and people die because of this uh, 700,000 to the tune of 700,000 people. I'd like to point out that we can't totally tell how much uh, this is a result of purely consuming animals that uh, themselves uh, relied on antibiotics for their growth compared to just humans themselves being over-prescribed antibiotics. Uh, that just uh, 
a distinction that needs to be made. Uh, and when we look at that uh, in the numbers, I think it would show that the number greatly diminishes from 700,000 if we're solely to look at uh, how the consumption of animals um, results in antibiotic-related uh, deaths. Moving on to the morality argument, uh, which is Clarice's final contention, uh, I want to bring up the point of Temple Grandin. She's an American scientist, uh, and she revolutionized the cattle industry. I'm not uh, an expert in cattle, uh, but the, the basics I understand from this is uh, she noticed that these, uh, these animals were not moving very well, and they were atrophying in the muscles, and they were overall uh, being very, uh, they're, they're living really miserable lives. And what she realized is that if we can develop a system where these cattle are moving, uh, their muscles will be better, uh, they'll be happier, and the quality of meat will be better. Um, so ultimately, I, I would say that businesses are motivated by profit, and this profit comes from providing the best quality of meat to the consumer. And the way you get that best quality of meat is by treating these animals well. Uh, that does not occur if factory farming were to completely torture uh, animals. And so that's why we don't see this complete torturing of animals. What we see is a, a care um, to the quality of these animals and their own well-being. And with that, I think I've proven that um, when we're looking at quality of life, uh, uh, we should, or not quality of life, but the protection of life, uh, you should vote nay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. With that, we'll open things back up to cross-examination. Clarice, you control this cross X. You got two minutes ready when you are. Amazing. I wanted to thank you so much for being here with me today, Michael. I just had a couple questions for you. So starting off, is hanging something humane? Death by hanging humane? Uh, I think that kind of depends on perspective for the vast majority of human Simple. existence. In hanging has been considered humane. Uh, personally, with our modern sense of morality, uh, I would argue that it's inhumane, but there's a very a way to die. Yeah. Well, okay. it's essentially a cultural relativism argument. Right. Is what it comes to. So um, obesity and diabetes is a pretty big problem in America, right? Uh, yes. Uh, if I remember correctly, 71.6% of Americans are overweight. So right. It, it's a, definitely an issue. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, what's going to be more expensive? You know, a healthcare bill for a heart attack or an insulin shot, a uh, vial of insulin, or a little bit more expensive meat? Uh, well, in, uh, the, the healthcare bill would obviously be, obviously be more expensive or the, the insulin Thank shot. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, overall, you make the argument about um, rural jobs. Um, wouldn't you argue that these rural jobs would still exist without factory farming? I would not make that argument. Okay, good to know. And um, yeah, and wouldn't you say that, okay, when we're looking at something like a death rate of less than 1%, COVID has a death rate of less than 1%, right? Yes. You see hundreds and thousands of people die. Is that not a serious disease? Well, that also, the thing with COVID that makes it deadly is that yeah. it's extremely okay. transmissible. Right. Um, so and, that's okay. also a thing that we need to take into account. Right. Not only does it kill a lot of people, but is it easily transmissible? Uh, amazing. And H1N1 wasn't a highly infectious disease, no? Uh, not as infectious as COVID. But it was an infectious disease, right? That did kill thousands of people? Thousands, yes, but not 500,000. Tens of thousands, but yeah. In America. Okay. yeah. Great. Um, All right. Thanks, uh, thanks a bunch. That wraps up cross-examination. We're going to turn the floor back to the affirmative for the beginning of the rebuttals. Clarice, this is the first affirmative rebuttal. You get three minutes for this one, but do please start us off with a brief off-time roadmap before you begin your speech. Ready? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Guy. So a quick off-time roadmap is I'm going to begin by going over their camera contention two on rural jobs, then moving on to their camera contention one, affordable foods, and lastly going over um, in order my own case. So my first contention, then my second contention. So getting started right now, the negation wants to make this great argument that factory farms are helping rural jobs, but that's simply not true. According to the Humane Society of the United States, factory farms are actually making it increasingly difficult, if not impossible, for independent family farms to survive due to the corporate competition with large-scale corporate um, factory farmings. So because of this, they've 
Factory farming has made the cost of meat so low that independent family farms have a really hard time being able to sell their meat. So what they do is they enter these contracts with factory farms. And while 75% uh, of the contractees surveyed felt that entering the chicken production contract had been a good decision, only 35% said that they would recommend the same decision to others after actually entering it. So a big issue with this is according to the United Food and Commercial Workers Union, more than 71% of all contract chicken growers earn below poverty level wages. This is a big issue because we're actually seeing rural uh, workers making less due to factory farms. They own their farms, they have these farms, but they have to contract out to factory farms to stay in business. And because of this, they're losing money. So overall, this is harming the rural industry. Um, according to the Guardian 2016, the vast majority of factory farms have turned to automated technology to decrease labor needs. So they really only need these rural jobs to actually get the meat. And as we've already seen, they're paying them below the poverty rate. And while there might be a few more tech jobs, a massive deduction in overall jobs in rural communities. So now when we're looking at affordable foods, we can see a very clear turn here for the affirmation. So when we're able to see very cheap meats like beef and pork produced at low costs, we're over going to see more people buy these at higher rates. That is the good thing about it, as you could say. But the harmful part about it far outweighs any kind of good. What we see here is heart disease, which is one of the number one killers in America, and diabetes. Now, I would say that it's far more expensive to try to pay, especially when you're in poverty and the United States does not have universal health care, a bill for a heart attack or trying to pay for daily insulin. It's much more affordable to pay a tiny bit more for meat. And we're talking maybe $2 more a pound. That is far less than paying up to $100 a day for a vial of insulin or a multi-thousand dollar bill for getting rushed to the ER for a heart attack. Overall, we see that countries um, that are in poverty see far more rates of obesity. Um, and because of this, we farly see it, we see this because of factory farms. Now getting into the argument made on the next pandemic and our antibiotic resistance, uh, we would see here that automatically we're seeing these 700,000 deaths go directly to the affirmation. The negation does not mention once the fact that I said, and I have data saying that over 80% of the nation's antibiotics are uh, being seen and being pushed to animals. Uh, I talked about this in cross-examination, but still having a less than 1% death rate still caused tens of thousands and up to hundreds of thousands of deaths. We will see pandemics in the future. This is something not argued uh, or mentioned by the negation. And finally, if you're the Temple Grandin, um, they're still having a miserable indoor life packed. They might be able to move better and not be spasming, but they're still being hung, drowned, and clubbed in the head. That is not humane. Go to ask. All right, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for that, Clarice. With that, we're going to turn the floor back over to the negative. Michael, this is the uh, negative rebuttal and summary speech. You get up to five minutes for this one, but again, please start us off with a brief off time roadmap before you begin your speech. Ready when you are. Okay, thank you, Professor. For my roadmap, I'll just go over um, Clarice's two contentions in order and I'll go over my two counter contentions in order. So I'll start my time right now. Um, so first, when we're dealing with the issue of antibiotics uh, and developing resistance to these antibiotics, um, Clarice even said that uh, this could definitely become an even bigger problem in the future. What she's also underestimating is that at, as time passes and these bacteria get smarter, so do medical professionals, and we will get better at combating um, problems that arise from bacterial uh, resistance. Um, Moving on to the point that a lot of people die um, from obesity, for example, because of uh, access to food. Uh, this is something that I think is, is actually not a problem for me at all. Um, Hassan Piker, uh, a political commentator, pointed out that the, the ultimate reason behind um, the obesity problem in America is corn and the issue of corn, uh, in that uh, we'll have like saturated corn dishes and everything uh, people eat. I, this might seem a bit weird, but my mom, she has uh, an allergy to corn. And so uh, my family, we've been forced to cut out uh, our consumption of anything corn related. And what we've noticed is that that greatly limits the amount of options you have to choose from. And so it, the, the issue here is not that um, people are consuming too much meat, it's that uh, corn is what's causing um, this obesity issue. And then further, uh, Moving on to the issue of morality. Uh, the affirmative concedes my points here. Uh, I pointed out that with Temple Grandin, uh, she showed that um, she was able to increase the quality of cattle meat 
by ensuring that these cattle are treated better. Uh, and I pointed out specifically that these businesses have a profit incent a profit based incentive to treat these animals as humanely as possible. This was something that was conceded by the affirmative. And therefore, when we're looking at the morality argument, um, that just that argument just follows through for the negation here. Uh, moving on to the counter contentions I have. Um, the, the issue of rural jobs is essentially uh, very, very important here. Uh, I mean, the affirmative uh, never disagreed with me when I added the caveat to protecting life that we need to ultimately be concerned with human life. And uh, humans, the, one of the most important things to them is their jobs. Um, I mean, that's what we spend most of our life doing is working. And uh, what we've noticed is that one, having a job, frankly, is just better than having no job. Uh, and the affirmative makes the assumption that when we replace uh, or, or when we get rid of these factory farming jobs, that they'll just naturally be replaced. Uh, but that's just not something you can make. Uh, when we look at the case of NAFTA, uh, what happened with uh, the passing of NAFTA was that manufacturing jobs then got outsourced and they never came back. Our, the United States economy was forced to switch from a manufacturing-based economy to a service-based economy. Now I would argue the same thing applies with the food uh, the food market, especially because we're dealing with uh, the issue of efficiency. And I would argue that factory farms are much more efficient um, than family farms. And a drop in efficiency leads to a raise in cost. And if food is more costly, what that means is, again, 34.9% of Americans are food insecure. These people will simply not have food. They will go hungry. This is a problem that the affirmative fails to address. And then moving on to, uh, well, actually, I already addressed the issue of morality. Um, I guess the, the final issue here then is, uh, no, I, yeah, I've addressed food, uh, the food scarcity problem. Um, and I've pointed out that that's the one for the uh, negation. I point out the job problem, and that's also one for the negation. So when you guys are judging this round, you need to think about what is best uh, for life and more specifically human life. And what I've proven is that we, one, we need to eat, and two, we need to work. And factory farming uh, gives us the opportunity to do both of those things. Um, if we were to assume that uh, what the neighbor would, I, I presume would want, which would be to get rid of factory farming, these people are going to have less access, uh, oh, a, a greatly stunted access to food, which will mean they'll go hungry, and they'll simply lose their jobs. Uh, which means they won't even be able to afford uh, what little food they can already afford, especially if they're low income. And I have successfully proven, um, especially when it comes to the morality argument, that these businesses have an incentive uh, to be moral. Um, so when we're weighing this, I think I've proven that, that if factory farms aren't more beneficial than they are harmful, they are at least equal. And with that, uh, the judges and the audience should vote neg. Thank you. All right, and thank you, Michael. And with that, we will turn the floor back over to the affirmative one final time. Clarice, this is the second affirmative rebuttal and summary speech. You get up to three minutes for this one, but again, please start us off with just a quick off-time roadmap before you begin your speech. Okay, um, thank you. I'm just gonna do a quick off-time roadmap. So starting off, I'm gonna be going over just quickly the arguments that the negation has made and then finally ending off with some voters. So. Let's get started. So again, I think one of the main reasons uh, that we're, you're gonna be voting for the affirmation today is this argument of uh, harming rural workers. This is a really big thing in Central Valley specifically, and we overall see that factory farming makes rural workers work less. So the affirmation, uh, the negation comes up here and states that rural workers won't have a job without factory farmers. What they fail to address is that factory farmers are the one contracting independent farmers, meaning they'll still have their farm and they'll still be able to work, but without factory farming, they'll actually be able to sell their own meat instead of having to compete with factory farmings. Because they have to compete, they no longer can be selling their own goods because it would be too expensive for people to buy. But if factory farms didn't exist, then they'd be able to sell more. So then the affirmation states, well, if it costs more, the negation states if it costs more, that's not good. But we're simply stating that healthcare costs cost more. Now, the negation comes up here and states that corn is the cost of obesity, but we can see a direct link between fat consumption and obesity. That is something you cannot deny. And overconsumption of beef and cheap beef being caught, bought at higher and higher uh 
production rates is something that's causing obesity. So that's a clear win for the affirmation here. It is far more expensive to be um, going to hospitals, having heart attacks and paying for insulin than it is to pay a little bit more for meat. And paying a little bit more for meat means that rural workers will be making minimum wage and above minimum wage again. This is a far better trade-off. And overall, the uh, those in poverty will be able to afford the higher rates of food because they won't be paying these outrageous costs of healthcare due to having to buy insulin or take care of a heart attack. So now getting into this whole issue of humanity, I did state this in my first um, argument and my first speech. It's something that negation never addressed. So according to modern farmers, small local farms that do their own slaughtering in-house have the ability to spend time to humanely kill the animal, which involves stunning. So they don't feel the pain. So this is something that's unique to um, not having factory farms because they cannot be doing this at high speed productions. If they were trying to stun humanely every single animal, they wouldn't be able to do this at high speed productions. But that's exactly the issue. You need to be slowing down and taking your time. Overall, it's going to cost a little bit more, but we've already addressed for two reasons why the cost trade-off actually benefits the affirmation, because overall things are ultimately going to be cheaper. So therefore, uh, it's more humane to not have factory farms because small independent farmers can take the time to stun the animals. Now, in terms of pandemic and antibiotic resistance, we still see this as the major winning point for the affirmation. So again, this is something that goes completely unaddressed by the negation. Animals on U.S. factory farms consume over 80% of the nation's antibiotics. That kills over 700,000 people worldwide a year overall for the reasons of rural jobs um, being able to afford food um, having humane treatment of animals which ultimately uh, means humane treatment of humans which we've seen that's not addressed by the negation and finally stopping the next pandemic hopefully and lowering antibiotic resistance for these reasons and more it's a strong push for the affirmation thank you all right, and a big thank you to both of you for putting on a fantastic, uh, fantastic debate. Obviously, we'll leave the decision in this round for y'all, the uh, the audience, but I do appreciate you coming out here and putting on a good, uh, good performance tonight. So with that, thanks everyone. Well, folks, I want to again thank you for tuning in to our Spring 2021 Speech Night live stream. I hope you enjoyed the entire show. And if at the end of it, you found yourself thinking like, hey, this is something I might be interested in doing, I encourage you to check out our website, www.mjcforensics.org. There you can find a whole bunch of information about our team, as well as how to sign up. Well, folks, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.